This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Keller's Garden Center and Landscaping Services. Winter is here, and I encourage you to save your back this year. Contact Keller's today and get a quote for residential or commercial snow removal. And also, it is never too early to start thinking about spring. COVID has put a delay on so many things. Do not delay in getting yourself set up with one of the best in the business when it comes to getting your yard looking its best. Visit Keller's at their location on Kern Street in Exeter, Pennsylvania, just down the street from Blue Ribbon Dairy, or head over to their social media pages for more information. Welcome to the PopGo Project Podcast, a platform for the discussion and discovery of arts and entertainment. We focus on highlighting people and events that add value to the world around us. Visit us on all social media platforms by searching The PopGo Project or visit our website at thepopgoproject.com. Welcome to the show and thank you so much for listening. Got it. I authorized said recording. Yeah, it's too late now. It's, o- it's over. Away. You've been notified. All right. Can you hear me all right? Do I need to put these Johns on? Well, that's not going to help me hear you. Yeah, that's true. Can you hear me? I hooked I my can, little I, I can hear you. Jimmy thing up. I can hear you. Look at us spending quality time together on the internet, son. Dude, this is probably going to be the, the, the longest conversation we've had where it wasn't like over beers well actually i mean i'm having a beer i, I could not i couldn't not have a beer with you right you, you you are mr beer fest but um i always see you for two seconds at events and then you're gone then i go run it like i work for I a living what the fuck? Oh, yeah Just you go. do that's not it either that's my gut dude i got fat as fuck dude me too it's covid we, can, we have we have some that, that we can blame it on we, can, we have a we have a reason now nice but yeah, I think last time we, we spoke at length was probably uh, drunk after one of the Menzinger show in Scranton. Yep. I was yeah, at we, your house. I was at your house one time in Jersey back in like 2016, but you were hosting a party. You didn't have time to chit chat with me. It's fucking working, bro. Come on, son. It's yeah, I know. On, son. I always enjoy some of the popco in my life. You know I know. What I'm I, I see gonna... it at festivals and I'm running like I'm on fire. Yeah, we're here talking to John Henderson, Mr. Atlantic City. Hi, kid. Is that okay to say? Uh, you know what? Yeah, man. You, you go to war sometimes with the, you know. <laughs> I think it's par for the course. Like 20 years of doing this shit, some days you get exhausted and just want to kick dirt and start a fight, man. I'm a guy who once in a while, you know, you've seen it. I just, yeah. And this is a weird market, man. It's, uh, you know, it's, yeah. I hate saying it out loud, but it's a distressed market. So kind of doing what we do and getting people to kind of come out and say, hey, man, Atlantic City's rad. Don't uh, don't believe the hype and then getting them out for a programming, showing them, you know, a rad time. And we just hope, you know, the city itself reciprocates going, hey, you had fun over here. Cool. Come, you know. Yeah. So that's it. sometimes it's an uphill fight. Sometimes it's a fun sleigh ride. Who knows? Yeah. Well, John Henderson is the owner of Good Time Tricycles, Tricycle. Um, it's uh, entertainment event production company does a lot of big events uh, in Atlantic City. One of them being the uh, Atlantic City Beer and Music Festival, which I think at one point was up there like as number two in the country. Is that yeah, accurate? We're still there. Okay, yeah, we still, we still Atlantic, strong at that spot. That's that spot. Atlantic City Beer and Music Festival, number two in the country. And if you haven't gone, I haven't been to one. Uh, they're doing it again in June, right, of this year? Yeah, yeah, if you haven't gone, you haven't been, we've been doing this shit for 16 years, and if you haven't done it, you're making bad life choices. Yeah, you gotta go. And it's outdoors now. I mean, last year was a blast. A little you sunburn, know, I, a little good time. Yeah, you know, we got, you know, I had to hydrate more than uh, I would have when it was in March uh, at the convention center. That's but, the um, yeah. But yeah, not only uh, the beer fest, but yes, the, does the tattoo expo, the seafood fest. Uh, you're doing like a chili cook-off type thing this year. Chili cook-off and spicy food fest. Don't forget micro wrestling. Micro wrestling. How, who could forget that? Yep. Witchcraft. What else? Witchcraft. We got that Halloween mystical encounters with brews and spirits. Just you know. Just and all this of- info is on your website, right? Sure. Yeah. Head to 
And you want to head to our Facebook page, goodtimetricycle.com. Good luck spelling tricycle. Um, yeah. <laughs> That's easy, right? T R I C Y C L E. You know what? I went to school. Gold star, bro. Gold star. <laughs> You'd be surprised how many people misspell tricycle. It, yeah. it's, it's ridiculous. Yeah. And fun fact about Mr. Henderson, he uh, has ties to NEPA. I believe um, if you weren't born or you were at least you spent some time in Holly, Pennsylvania. Born um, in Hopedale, grew up in Holly, went okay. to school in Wilkes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, did it, did it, and migrated to uh, the Jersey Shore. Yeah. And I had the pleasure of meeting you for the first time. Uh, in my weekender days, you tried to bring the uh, beer and music festival to Scranton, Pennsylvania. You know, it's funny. Steamtown Beer and Music Festival. Yeah. Um, and, and look at look, look. Cool. Yeah, look at yeah. you break that fucking thing. <laughs> so I will tell you in my took a bath. Took a bath, right? Yeah, I lost seventy thousand dollars. Um, yeah, in my time. So here's what I equate it to, right? Um, in my time, twenty almost twenty years of event production, right? Um, you've got some, you have to have some wins and losses, right? It's it's how you grow. Uh, and at the time, I don't remember what year it was. It was probably on that stupid glass. 2013. Year. So in 2013, we thought that NEPA was, um, was ready. It was ready for kind of, kind of what we do. And we worked with the montage and, and you and, you know, a couple other folks to bring this festival, which we thought, you know, we had the Menzingers were actually one of our performing, one, one of our headliners for the second session, Fuel being kind of the first session headliner, um, thinking people were going to come out man and um a meteor might as well have crashed into the <laughs> earth and fuck it. nobody shows up uh it was my first major fail um and you know i mean the loss was around seventy thousand dollars and for a month i was fucking i was mad i was heartbroken i was you know and then as i kind of looked at it i looked at it as a as a college course man uh there were a lot of learnings a lot of takeaways you know about going into markets that you know may seem ready but aren't um and you know here you know what my major takeaway is i was gonna ask you what is it i mean let's talk about how nepa let you down um I, you know it, for what we did at the time nepa seemed a little more behind the craft beer scene than some of the other places um you know the you know the music scene fuel all right you know all right um but the Menzingers, right? You know, it was rad to see the Menzingers before the Menzingers were kind of where they are now, right? And they yep. played other festivals and events that we've had and we're giant fans. You know, my takeaway was it was it was a great learning experience. It made me hone my budget skills a lot better, but you know, I made a lot of friends out of it. You know, and I think, you know, can you put a price on that shit? No, right? Um you know, we got to interact with some other breweries from the region. We coerced those breweries to distribute in other markets. Made friends with the guys from the Menzingers, met you. You know, I think that was a huge takeaway. And, that's you know, worth not, the not, loss. Not that's worth the loss. Smoke up your ass, you fart smoke rings, bro. But, you know, I mean, you, we've been friends since then. Yeah. You know, and I fucking, that's a huge takeaway for me. You know, we, you know, we text, we talk, we don't see each other as much as we should see each other. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that's a good takeaway. You know, so, you know, what is it, eight years later? I ain't mad. I mean, nine. It's like it's nine it's now. Nine? Yeah, I mean nine fuck? this year. You're, you're aging me, man. When I started this shit, I was handsome and had hair. <laughs> you never had hair when I met you. See, that's how <laughs> tough shit. But I started this shit 16 years ago. Yeah, you were a handsome devil. Back you looked like day. looked like uh, the lead singer of uh, Eve Six. Yeah. No. No, I don't know. Now well, I got a good lead singer of Eve, Eve Six. We got the power to do that. Yes, I do. Fucking internet, bro. Internet. <laughs> internet. But yeah, so I mean, I'm I'm worth the the seventy thousand dollar hit. 100%. It was it was interesting too because I remember you know we were, uh, you know I look back on that as as something you know a learning experience for me too because um <clears throat> I was the GM for about about a year at that point at the weekender and um you know you called us up and said hey you know I'm looking for sponsors and. I kind of dropped my pants for you. You did. You were very generous with the, with the uh, yeah. Yeah, no, and we didn't ask. We uh, I think we worked out a deal where you uh, purchased an app through us, and we did a whole voting thing, yep. which was great. But um, 
you know, the, my predecessors, a lot of times we just wanted to be part of these big events and we didn't want our next door neighbors to jump on it. If, you know, if we didn't. Well, you saw the vision. I think you saw what, you know, what we did here um, and seeing how, you know, this should translate in pretty much every market. And I'll tell yeah. you for, from a career standpoint, um, not owning it and kind of taking this thing across the country, you know, and we've got a lot of other events, um, but in not really saying, all right, and, and in giving up the first year and not coming back, I think was probably a mistake. Um, I think there's probably better places than the montage place center to do it. Um, it's a big spot. We had ties. Yeah, we had ties there. Um, but, you know, I think in make kind of the mistakes, like when you look back at your career and everybody does this kind of looking backwards and saying, all right, uh, not grabbing the bull by the horns and saying, all right, well, we're going to keep doing it. Like push ahead, push ahead, push ahead. Cause I think it would have ultimately paid off and kind of doing it in other cities. Um, I think it was probably from a career standpoint, a, um, a big mistake, but in this market, right. Um, I get referred to as the beer fest guy mm -hmm. me out of my fucking mind. I hate it <laughs> because we've accomplished so much more. Right. right. And there's just so many things that we've done that have been impactful. Um, you know, that piece, you know, kind of makes me crazy. I mean, we're responsible for 125,000 people coming into the Atlantic City market. You know, it's at uh, upwards of $20 million in economic impact, blah, blah, blah. But yeah, I think, you know, in going back, you guys saw, and you saw the <laughs> vision, you saw, you know, kind of what it turned into here, what it is here today, right? And thinking, you know, this translate and translates in this market. And at the time, it did. Yeah, I don't know what the reason was. I mean, you had, you know, one of the top stations in the market, you know, backing you as well. You had the number one entertainment newspaper backing you. You had all the right people as as far as getting the word out. You know, this area messaging. No, this this area is is a bizarre <laughs> bizarre place. Yeah. But yeah, but you know, but I mean good things came out of it, you know, our relationship with the Menzingers, our relationship with you, our relationship with a lot of the breweries, you yeah. know. So, you know, you take those things in stride and you continue to grow when you can. And how did you get into all this? You know, you've been doing it for almost 20 years. Um, I mean, no one just wakes up one day and says, I want to start producing, you know, beer festivals. I mean, obviously you started somewhere. How did that all happen? So it didn't start with beer festivals. Right. Um, it didn't even start with craft beer, honestly. Uh, I've been in Atlantic City for a lengthy period of time. Um, I was a player development or casino host. Essentially, that is somebody who you create a re relationship within within a uh, gaming organization, and they kind of kind of create a clear path, or you know that person that helps you jump the line, gets you take takes you to dinner, blah blah blah. Essentially, the person who um, is your is your guy in the casino world if you are a gambler, um, and I was that guy. So. Initially was a from the jump is I'm a planner, right? And like to put you know square pegs and square holes and round pegs and round holes and make sure experiences are what they are. You know, I was somebody's essentially tour guide to Atlantic City. And if I could do that by one off, one off, one off, um, you know, awesome. Well, I was in the industry for I want to say about 12 years. I've been thriving, actually doing very well. Uh, and a good friend of mine, um, and you know Mark Fairchild, a good friend of mine wanted to broach the idea of uh, doing tattoo conventions in Atlantic City. And at the time, tattoo conventions were few and far between. Uh, I think Ink in the Valley by you guys was still a thing. Uh, and he had tapped me on the shoulder and said, hey, you know, you know everybody in this city. Uh, what are your thoughts? You want to try to do this? And I was like, fuck yeah, let's do it. You know, and we, we crafted... Uh, in 2000, and I'm looking at a poster because that's how I figure out dates and <laughs> walk around our office and look at posters. But I want to say this was 2004. So in 2004, we launched um, the Atlantic City Tattoo Expo at the time called Draw on the Wild Card. Uh, and it was, it was a huge success, you know, working in the convention center and got a year of that under the, my belt. Uh, and I was, I was a a beer snob. So I wouldn't drink Bud, Budweiser. I wouldn't drink Miller Lite. I wouldn't drink you know, any of that shit. It was always, you know, either Bex or Oma Gang or, you know, uh, Flying Fish or, you know, so I kind of leaned towards that craft beer world um, and didn't understand, you know, being in a casino world and kind of exposed to kind of some higher end, finer things. Um, I knew that better beer was still affordable. Uh, and I knew that there was an opportunity and we went to a 
I don't forget, I forget the name of it, uh, an industry event, um, a beer industry event somewhere in Pennsylvania. And it was poorly done, really poorly done. And from, you know, the first year of the Tattoo Expo, you know, when I produced it, experience meant a lot to me. Uh, and what that was like for a consumer um, from the tattoo front, but just from the consumption front and the, you know, be a, being a part of something. And I was looking at this retail event or, whole, you know, for wholesale, whatever you want to call it, B2B event. And I was like, this can be done uh, as a, as a, in a festival environment, you know, as an opportunity for discovery, for, uh, for attendees, for beer lovers, you know, the opportunity to drink better beer. Uh, so we started to kind of get to work and figured out what the legality was, legalities were, you know, liquor licensing, you know, beer distributors, you know, sampling and jumped right into uh, what was the Atlantic City Beer Festival. Uh, and, you know, took about a year and a half to get off the ground. You know, we launched the festival in 2006 with 28 breweries. Um, you know, limited music. I think the band at the time that we used was the Toga Party Band. Um, I don't think that's who it was. Uh, and then kind of little games here and there, but really under the guise of, you know, drink better beer. You know, and our, our sponsors at the time being Michelob Ultra, which, which was considered craft, um, some Corona, some kind of real weird, you know. And that first year, kind of on a whim, I thought, you know, well, what are we going to see? And it was... Um, two all-day sessions, Saturday and Sunday, eight hours of craft beer, uh, you know, 28 breweries, and we saw 3,000 people. We're like, oh, shit, all right, this has some momentum. Um, and still working my casino job, you know, you're bringing in customers and kind of, you know, so essentially doing 120-hour weeks, like, let's just jam as much shit in a 10-pound bag as we can uh, and, and you know, pull it off. And, you know, the festival hit, and kind of caught some momentum, caught some momentum year two, uh, still, you know, all day sessions, um, you know, six hour sessions, I think they were at the time and, uh, saw 5,800 people, almost 6,000 people, you know, and it's very rare that events see double digit growth. Right. So I was like, Holy shit. Um, and one of the problems we saw was for the tickets we sold, we had a line around the block, right? Line around the block to get in. So people weren't getting in in a super timely manner. Um, and it was a little chaotic of all day of craft beer drinking, you know, because at that time people weren't used to or weren't aware of high ABV beers. You know, they're used to kind of the lighter beers. And, you know, now we're giving them a couple beers that were 12 percent or, you know, and <laughs> it was like just running down the line, punching people in the face. Yeah. You get shit phased. You get shit phased. <laughs> you get shit phased. They're used to so, four percenters. So the one yeah, beer is like equal yeah. to three. Yeah. So, you know, the evolution turned into, um, you know, all right, well, let's sit down and kind of rebuild this so that, you know, we're not blasting everybody. Um, and there was a there was a financial model that had to be adjusted because, you know, our model was always uh, we didn't want brewers to donate the beer because we thought there was a craft behind it and they should be compensated. Uh, so we kind of built the, what, you know, what we thought the amount of consumption per consumer was into the thing, into the into the ticket price. Um, well, yeah, I mean, it's essentially started from that and kind of snowballed, you know, it was just, I attended an event and was already kind of started to do events, um, with the tattoo expo and thought, all right, this can do, be a better experience. And then kind of it snowballed, you know, it just every year got better and better. We broke down to the four sessions in 2006 is when the festival launched in 2010 um, we launched, it turned into a beer and music festival and the first bands were the Bouncing Souls, Reverend Horton Heat and Rusted Root. And that same year we launched the Atlantic City, which is now the, uh, Down Beach Seafood Festival. Um, so started to add more programs. I think that year we launched a cigar gala as well and just kind of went full immersed into, um, into the event world. Uh, so much so that we were thriving and I left my job. Uh, in the meantime, as I was doing Kind of the casino host thing and the uh, player development thing. Um, I said I decided, you know what, I'm jumping ship. I've I'm doing well here, um, and I put my resignation into Caesar's Entertainment. They're like, no, 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 no. Have some more money, and stay on and do what you're doing out there for us 
inside and they promoted me to the director of business development for the Eastern Division of Caesars Entertainment, where, you know, it created events for the Food Network, uh, chocolate for the Food Network, um, Food Network, the Atlantic City Food Network, Food and Wine Festival. I did a soap opera event. I created what's now the National Beverage Program for Caesars Entertainment. So hung in there for about three more years. And then, you know, three years into our deal with the Food Network, uh, that deal was expiring. Uh, we were really thriving. We had a bunch of events on the outside. I was burning the candle at both ends, like exhausted, burning the candle. You know, I had staff outside of the festival um, uh, or outside of uh, Caesars Entertainment, you know, just good time tricycle staff and just said, fuck it, you know, resigned on my birthday and said, hey, you know, thanks for all the good years. You guys have been great for me, but, you know, I've got to pursue this and kind of do my thing and resigned August 4th. 2012, I think it was. Oh, yeah. And not only were you doing all of that, I mean, you had a family too. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I got married a pretty girl, kept knocking her up, making some babies. <laughs> um, she's allergic to sperm, that shit hits her, she busts, breaks out babies. Um, yeah, we had four kids. Um, one's a tattoo artist in Philly now, uh, one's a video game kid, one's in college, and one's 13. So, you know, just making babies and trying to do a career on the Jersey shore, bro. That's not easy. It's not <laughs> making the babies is easy. That that's the fun part. That's, the, <laughs> that's, the, that's, that's the, the fun, fun part. part. <laughs> yep. Yep. Five minutes later. Shit. Yeah. Whoops. Yep. Yep. Phone rang. It startled me. I didn't get to pull out. <laughs> <laughs> Goddamn phone. Yep. A pull out game on this one is bad. <laughs> oh man. But yeah. So, I mean, you, you were going to do that on your own. Eventually, they, they convinced you to stay, do a bunch of money, and it's great. Um, you know, and you finally did, did it on your own. You're like, screw this. I could do it myself. I want to be on my, my own. How scary was that? I mean, at this point, like, you're, I mean, you had a good foundation, right? But you're going to go on your own. You have a family to support. How, how scary was it, or was it not? Well, I, I don't scare easy. I never was somebody who scared easy. Um, and I always thought something worth going into was worth going into aggressively, right? Um, so I don't think that, I don't know that there was fear. Um, I am, actually, there was no fear. It was just, all right, I've got a, I got a thing coming um, and fucking run, just do it. And that's exactly what we did. And we just haven't looked back. I'll tell you that leaving the, for my, I don't think she's going to listen so I can say it. Um, <laughs> she doesn't listen to my podcast either. <laughs> Um, that time, I think in my relationship, we're going to get into some Dr. Phil shit right now, bro. Okay, let's do it. In my relationship with my wife, um, the casino years, it was a taxing, you know, it was casinos, the casino lifestyle was taxing on my relationship. I can tell you from the moment I resigned to this very moment today, my relationship with my wife has been fantastic. You know, it was getting away from kind of that, those other distractions and kind of use and with my family building in this business was probably the best thing I've ever done for kind of my long-term family health and mental health was to kind of go out on my own. So yeah, the fear thing is non-existent, you know, because, you know, and, and looking back, best thing I ever did hundred percent for financially, mentally, and, you know, for my relationship with my family. Yeah, I don't think people really understand unless they're in it or they've seen it. I mean, you know, people who work in restaurants and that kind of industry, like at night, you're not home. Mm-hmm. And the wives, are, the wives are home and or, you know, if, whether it's reversed or whatever it might be, like, you know, your mind wanders. What are, you know, what are they doing? And there's a lot of temptations in a, a casino setting, the restaurant life, the bar life, all that kind of stuff. Yep. Uh, there's temptations. The devil is lurking on the corner. Um, and it, yeah, I could definitely see where that could, um, you know, put uh, a strain, so to speak. And so it sounds like you made the right move. Yeah, no, it was, you know, I mean, again, we all, we're all growing every day, you know, even when we're 90, we're still learning, right? Yeah. And that for me was, you know, and I didn't realize it at the time, you know, I didn't realize it at the time, but I did, and sooner than later, found my relationship with, with my wife, Carol, just significantly better and better and better and better and better and I was like wow all right cool you know and she was invested right she sure. you, know, you know you've been to the events she she sees you more than I do she sees you <laughs> before I do yeah 
you know, and, you know, she just, you know, and it was something we did together as a family to the point where all the kids were involved, mm -hmm. you know, so yeah, for the long-term growth, yeah, it was, it was an unexpected bonus. Yeah, that's great. And you talk about not having fear, and obviously that's true because you take risks with every new event that you try and do, mm -hmm. um, which is great. I mean, how do you, you know, Seafood Fest makes sense because, you know, you're in Lake City, you're Seaside, all that kind of good stuff. How do you go about, you know, picking other events to try and make work? I mean, you, had, you did a bizarre uh, AC event, which was one of my favorites, mm -hmm. the Chelsea Hotel back in 2000, I want to say 16, 15, 2015, I think it was, or 16, I can't keep track anymore. But I mean, that was a great event, great spot. Um, you know, how do you pick and choose what events you try and pull off, you know, the partners you choose to, to work with? I mean, how does it, how does it all come together? Um, you know, I'm very, I pay attention to trends and lifestyle and, and I look for kind of gaps. I look for what this region could use and what this region will embrace by kind of all the moving parts within it. Um, and culinary is a sweet spot for us, right? Uh, people like to eat, people like yeah. to, you know, and I'll say it a bunch of times. My team is sick of me hearing me say it, but opportunity for discovery, you know, and I, and I bang that nail to death, you know, as human beings, we want to discover and we want to be, you know, the first to show somebody. And I think a lot of our success in our events comes from that, you know, we want to show you something you haven't seen. We want to show you, we want to, we want you to experience a flavor you haven't experienced before. We want you to meet people and see bands you haven't seen before. We want you to laugh at things that you might not have laughed at before, um, you know, and creating experiences around that and multi-layered experiences, right? So, you know, you're going to come to witchcraft and you're going to experience spirits and restaurants and you're going to get dressed up and you're going to get scared and you're going to, you know, all of that in a four hour time frame. So we take these kind of short windows and we create opportunity within those four windows, uh, within those windows. Um, and I always approach an event or a new concept like that, like how dimensional is it? You know, is there an opportunity for discovery? Uh, is there an opportunity for camaraderie? Uh, is it a place to make new friends? Is it a place to hang out with existing friends? So I kind of ask myself all these questions when I go into it. And, you know, what is the after kind of shockwave? You know, are people, is it going to be something that people talk about? You know, are we going to be able to build it? And I've been relatively successful in building a lot of these programs word of mouth. Right. I had such a great experience, you know, and, you know, they leave a review. They tell, you know, two friends who tell two other friends and out of those, you know, four people two buy tickets and, you know, and it just keeps over and over and over again. Um, but really, you know, I kind of lean on that lifestyle, you know, opportunity for discovery and human curiosity um, and culinary seems to be that kind of that that hot button. You know, people are consumers and they want to consume. Yeah, I mean, food and drink, big, big, uh, big joys in life, right? And I mean, hey, I mean, I want to talk about the beer fest real quick. I mean, one week or one one year, I walked or I came down with I think twelve people. You know, I went down, I came down the twenty fourteen with like four of us, and the next year I told all my friends, and there was you know twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen of us. Um, so you're right, you know, you you give people the experience, and they tell their friends, and you now we're coming from four hours away, so it's obviously it's. A great weekend. It's a great time. I mean, beer fest. If you don't like music, there's the beer. There's um, uh, the stripper dunk tank. There are the toilet, the toilet racing. There's giant cornhole. There's you know, to the dizzy bat field goal thing. And there's literally something for everyone. Even if you don't drink, like you can go there and have a great time. So you do a really great job at obviously offering something for everyone uh, at all these events. I mean, the seafood fest is a, a wonderful. Uh, family event, you know, you have, um, you know, you can take your, you know, four or five year old kid with you. Um, there's a lot of uh, activation for an audience of that age too. So, yeah, you really do keep keep that in mind with everything you do. Yeah, and we and we always want to make something fresh. So, you know, there will always be the kind of the same things that people really enjoyed at a lot of the festivals. We'll re we'll recreate those, uh, but then there's always something new. Right. Like, you know, you mentioned Seafood Fest, like, you know, we threw the hula dancers in the mix this year. You know, we've done the pet costume contest as part of the Seafood Fest, crab cake eating contest, chowder cook off, craft beers of New Jersey tasting tent, like just with cooking demos, you know, it, wine seminars, just 
you know, really kind of saying, all right, well, well let's take all your senses. You think you're going to be here for an hour, but we're going to keep you for two or three, you know, and with, you know, with um, the tattoo expo, it's the same exact thing. You know, it's like, yeah, you're going to come, you're going to meet artists you've never met before. You're going to, you could possibly get tattooed by somebody on the West coast. You won't, would never have the opportunity to get tattooed by, oh, by the way, you know, there is a eight foot tall, gorgeous woman swallowing swords while a three foot tall micro penguin with weird hands, you know, is dangling off of her tassels. Like just what up, you know, we, we <laughs> give people something to talk about. And, you know, I hate that people are always this. I hate this. I hate this. I hate this. Right. But we're giving people real Instagrammable moments. Right. You know, and I guess that's good for you, too. Oh, 100 percent, 100 percent, because I'll go through um, I'll go through Instagram after an event and I'll put our hashtags in and I'll just see how many there are. Mm -hmm. You know, we're getting to the point where there's tens of thousands of them, you know, for across the span of all of our events. Uh, and I go in and, you know, and I thank everybody for coming. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming. I try to personally touch as many attendees as possible. The mace burns when you do that, but try to touch all of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. And you know you you take the risks. I know you did the one year the cider social when ciders were kind of kind of big. That was yeah, that was a, that was that a one years. and done? No, or? we did that for two years, two? Um, and both were very successful. Yeah. And you know, again, when we we pick a trend, we follow it, and we try to throw fuel on that trend. Um, and we watch that overnight, almost like the weird kind of alcoholic soda thing go. Yeah. Literally watch the cider trend um, peak and crash in the three year period, which was weird, uh, which oddly enough, the seltzer trend is following right now. Right, and you're doing right. one of those, right? Yep, um, no, because we <clears throat> saw that, I was watching it and I saw the seltzer trend go <whistles> kind of even out and now it's starting to do this. Yeah, because I saw I saw signs for that, Geology. was it like, yeah. Um, yeah COVID had kind of pulled the wind out of that sales. Um, you know, right after Beer Fest, we were gonna jump into it and it was still, you know, people were kind of still bugging out about COVID, bugging yeah. out about COVID. And I was like, you know what? Let's kill it. Uh, and we were not known for killing an event, you know, mid in mid production, right? And I was like, yeah, writing's on the wall. Let's let's kill it. And it's funny, we killed it. And that weekend was a major monsoon in Atlantic City. So it was like matrix dodging oh, cool. bullets and shit, right? You know, so yeah, you know, and then you know, looking back at it, uh you know, it was probably a blessing in disguise. You know, we didn't spend a couple hundred grand on producing, you know, this event that was going to fizzle out three years later. Right. You know, and, you know, I've kind of got this, you know, and I said earlier, I hate to be the beer fest guy, but we have a commitment to craft beer that we had for 16 years. And we saw the um, whole seltzer movement kind of punch in craft beer in the gut uh, so much so that these craft beer guys were creating seltzers, which was so out of their wheelhouse that coming into uh, 2022, coming into this year's beer fest, we really need to remind people that, man, there's so much fucking good beer out there, you know, uh, stop with the weird distractions with bubbly drinks and get back to pouring fucking barley and hops in your face holes, you bunch of fucking pansies. <laughs> well, that's a good, that's a good segue. I mean, I, I feel like a, you get to a point where, you know, there's so many craft beers out there. You know, there's obviously some big players that are consistent. They taste great. They're just consistently good. And there's some fly-by nighters and you know whatever small 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 batches. But do you ever think that you get to a point where someone's going to be like, I just want to have a fucking Miller Light. Like enough with the fucking hops. You know, smashing me in the mouth. Like, do you ever think there's going to be a time where the craft beer kind of goes backwards, or do you think it maybe already has with the ciders and the seltzers, and now it kind of pushed them out of the way again and you know, it back has, up. It's very ebb and flow, right? Um, you'll go through years where kind of the IPA burn and triple hop, quadruple hop, you know, IPAs and, you know, um, it ebb and flow. And it's funny when I talk to people who uh, attend the festival, because, you know, hey, I mean, we've been doing this for 16 years, right? How do you keep it? Ex how do you keep it exciting? How do you keep it flavorful? You know, I always task people again i'm going to go to opportunity for discovery to drink outside of their wheelhouse you know what do you normally like who do you normally drink great they're all still going to be here go do something new go try something new go try a brewery you've never tried before and try a style that might be out of your wheelhouse you know just try it give it a shot i am um i'm a belgian white guy i don't i very rarely stray uh you know if 
if somebody has a Belgian white, it's kind of the first thing I go to when I see a beer list, you know, my safety beer is always Allagash white. Um, then I'll, you know, I'll play around with lagers and, you know, once in a while I'll go to the IPA when I'm feeling adventurous, I go to the sour. So I kind of stay all over the map and it's by design, um, lead by example, right? you know, try different things, right? You know, so, you know, when we go to, and I, and I talk about it, you, you, you know, you followed me on Instagram or you'll see if I'm trying different things, I'm very vocal about it, you know, because I'm encouraging others to do the same exact thing. And I think that's how with these festivals, the industry kind of flows with itself, how to support a lot of these brands and how to support new styles and, you know, hazy this and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, I think it's just encouraging people to kind of go outside of their comfort zone with, with flavor. I'm a big fan of the hazy stuff this year. Yeah, dirty beer. Yeah, whatever. Mm-hmm. I like and it. And a lot are. There's, you know, um, our friends at Bolero Snort make a lot of hazy stuff, and gosh, it's all delicious. You know, I am, you know, I, I believe in a thing called palate fatigue that uh, too many different alcohol sources and too much hop will burn your palate to where you can't really um enjoy a lot of things so i like to tell people kind of start off on the lower abv side um stay away from crazy ipas in the beginning and then work up to it and you'll kind of avoid what's called palate fatigue yeah and this past year in 2021 you did it outside at uh bader field um which was once the host to uh the seafood fest right yep. um well you know what let's well let me ask this question first before we get into um, the beer fest and it's the reason for that you say you, you don't have fear okay well i know that when 2020 came and covid you know basically ruined the entire year because your first event of the year typically is in march of uh the, the year um typically the late late march early april that's that's a beer fest and obviously covid came in middle of march of 2020 and basically crushed your entire year. I mean, that had to be maybe the one moment of your life where you had to have been scared. It was a lot. So a very confident person, never really understood the anxiety thing. Number, And I felt it. I saw it happening in real time uh, when it was announced and they started to talk about it. I, had, I remember taking my daughter to dinner. She wanted to go to dinner. Um, and I, it was all happening in real time. Uh, and I took her and I was very kind of in a fog because I knew what was happening, you know, and I didn't, I don't know what it was, but I could sense that this is going to fuck us, right? Um, it was essentially four weeks before the, before the 2020 festival. Uh, and I had this insane feeling that I've never felt before. It was this weird feeling of lack of control and sinking, right? And I didn't, I never experienced anything like this before. Um, and it threw us in this crazy, you know, and brought the staff in. I was like, all right, we need to watch this. We need to watch this. Um, and I'd said in a meeting when they were like, ah, oh, two weeks to, you know, give us two weeks. I was like, this yeah. isn't a two-week thing. No. This isn't a two-week thing. This is long-term. Um, and how prepared financially, how prepared mentally, you know, and how does this affect um, an industry that's sole purpose? And my sole purpose from, you know, has been for my entire career, bringing people together, be it, you know, one by one or by the tens of thousands and saw it coming. And I remember my daughter saying, it's just going to pass. And I was in this bay and she was 17 years old, 18 years, 17 years old. And I was like, no, it's not, you know, and you don't know what you're talking about. And then here I was, you know, uh, let kept the staff on till about June and was like, all right, you know, this is, you know, all hands on deck, you know, what do we do? Um, and had to lay everybody off and Jim started to say, okay, you know, put finances in place, um, made some financial decisions that today I regret because I didn't have to do it. Um, started the begging the government process, you know, uh, getting kind of getting ready to, and not sure. Working on a resume, I hadn't, I've never done a resume, you know, I didn't have to, because I've always wrote, written my own ticket. Um, 
you know, and just kind of really saying, all right, how do I navigate? What are my next steps in life? Am I, am I going to be selling cars? Am I going to be, you know, do you want prize with that? You know, what am I capable of doing? You know, so it was a real awkward um, dive into mental health that I wasn't, I don't think I was ever prepared for, uh, or, you know, didn't know a thing, you know, like, you know, again, going back to a guy who never really feared anything, you know, now I was kind of staring at the kind of a career financial uncertainty, you know, making from going to, from making X amount of dollars to, you know, two, uh, 2020 was a quarter of a million dollar hard loss for our company. Mm-hmm. You know, and how do you dig out of that? You know, and, uh, you know, fortunately, you know, paid a lot of attention, a lot of attention to what was going on. You know, like everybody said, follow the science. Um, and was never a denier, but was always like, yeah, this isn't something that's going anywhere ever. Like ever, we need to be prepared to live with it. And was saying it for re- relatively from the jump. Um, and a lot of things that are being you know, put out there now, we were saying earlier, but I'm not a fucking doctor. I'm just, you know, maybe was I being optimistic? Was I being realistic? You know, and then as the kind of the cloud started to kind of part, we saw where, you know, opportunity lied. Um, had to make some significant changes, financial changes to the company. Um, had to make some changes as far as kind of the, the festival, you know, as itself. And it's funny because at the same time we were going through this, we were going through this weird negotiation process with the convention center about the festival. Um, and they came out with a lot of crazy numbers as far as, you know, essentially raising our rent significantly like at, and coming out of a pandemic, right? Um, well, we made the decision in, in going back and forth um, with the convention center and more so um, uh, Comcast Spectra, Spectacor. Um, we were initially going to say, okay, well, we're going to do the festival. We're going to do it outside, but we're going to do it in your parking lots adjacent to the, to the uh, building. And found ourselves being put, and at this time we had already had 16 or 17,000 tickets sold and very few people were turning their tickets and gave everybody that option. Like where yeah. Ticketmaster were complete fucking scumbags, you know, saying, you know, oh, we'll give you credit for this. We'll give you credit for that. And trying to bully us into the same thing. And it's why we don't use Ticketmaster now. We were like, you need to give these fucking people their money back. You know, God forbid the, you know, the $140 for two tickets that people bought, you know, help them, you know, pay an electric bill feed their family. Like you give those fucking people that money back or we're going to burn your fucking building down. Like you work for me. I don't fucking work for you. Yeah. And that was the ticket. That was literally the ticket master conversation. Like I and Platt said to him, we will expose every shitty portion of you. You will give these fucking people their money back. You'll do it in a timely manner. You know, and they're like, well, you know, that affects you. I was like, all right, but that's my problem. Making sure I will not, I couldn't sleep thinking for a single second that people thought we fucked them out of a dollar. You know, and that we were greedy. I couldn't, I, I literally couldn't process that. So that was a battle. And then, you know, the convention center trying to hold a gun to our head, raising prices, raising costs. You can't use this without this. And having a conversation with, you know, the mayor saying, hey, you know, we need to be outside. We're going to take, and we changed the dates a couple of times. We went from March to August. And then from August to April. And then from April, it was like, yep, nope, we're going to be in June. You know, so we kind of did, 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 and, you know, bands jumping and coming back in and jumping and coming back in and then, you know, trying to find bands that wanted to perform right out of right out of the cooties, man. Like trying to find those bands was a fucking nightmare. Uh, fortunately, we had good relationships with guys like Lesson Jake. They want to play, you know, face to face. They want to play, you know, early November. They want to play, you know, so we I probably got off track because I do that. Oh, just, uh, you're, you're good. It kind of went right into where I was going uh, before I asked the question about being scared of the, the you know, your yeah, business, so, your livelihood. Yes, fucking terrified. So <clears> yes, <throat> I experienced fear, um, experienced anxiety, like, and I think we had talked about it, and I, we did a podcast on it as well with the big boy voices. Um, yeah, it was kind of a foray that to this day still affects me, which is weird. Um, I fear at times that that whole thing took away some of the passion that I had for event producing, right? Like that, that fear piece, I struggle with that today. I struggle with that 
you know, to where before I'd get an email where somebody would opt out or, you know, never phased me as I got, but now it's, I feel like finding like little things like that probably phase me a little more. Um, and I don't know why I can put a finger on it. You know, now that we're, you know, COVID it didn't pass. We're still fucking dealing. We're still fucking talking about it. It's fucking absurd. Um, tired of it. <laughs> tired of it. Yeah. Dude. You know, it's like, you know, I'm going in the store and I, you know, I, you know, you, I look at lead by example and I say that a bunch you know, understand that people have feelings and blah, 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 you know, I'm willing to make sacrifices uh, myself so that, you know, other people feel comfortable around, but it's like, it's exhausting, right? Um, and we're in that place where I thought we'd be, you know, two years ago, like, we're going to have to live with it. And now that's kind of everybody's like, hey, we're living with it, you know? Um, but being the first event, you know, it's kind of staying the course and saying, all right, well, we're still doing this, we're still doing this. We were the first event, um, minus some sporting events, uh, to hit the East Coast uh, right after COVID restrictions were kind of pulled back. As we were leading into it, um, I started to see gaps and opportunities, which drove us to kind of the larger space. Bader Field having Sandcastle Stadium and sports sports uh, facilities saying, hey, you know, you can do outdoor gatherings if you've got parking lots of X amount of uh, an X amount of this. And I did the math for Bader Field as it was connected to the surf stadium. And I was like, okay, well, I've got 146 acres. And if I spread a festival out over this space, you know, and limit our capacity to where we were typically 30,000, brought it to 16,000, um, spread everybody 10 foot, of pe every uh, beer and exhibitor and 10 foot apart, do it on, you know, what was, 1.4 million square feet everybody got could get a 12 by 12 block to themselves if they wanted to like did all the math and found all the loopholes and i was like all right here's how we're going to do it and brought it to um the mayor uh our health uh our health commissioner um and kind of ran it up a bunch of flagpoles and figured out how to move forward you know i'll tell you that that part of it was relatively exciting and I don't know if it was exciting because I was like, yeah, I'm bucking the system. I'm going to be the first uh, until that weekend when we were the first and there were fucking hell news helicopters flying over the fucking Bader field <laughs> and my phone blowing up with reporters I've never talked to before. And, you know, people actually, I've never had anybody openly rooting for us to fail. And there was a whole group of people out there going, it's still a pandemic. You're irresponsible. And blah, blah, blah. Super spreader event, super spreader event. And I just kept like, holy fuck, and just wanting to de defy it all. And we pulled it off to rave reviews, which then, you know, with the kind of going back and forth with the convention center and a weird level of greed that I've never experienced before from an organization, um, led us to say, all right, well, fuck it. We're now an outdoor festival. And we're now in June, which then told, which took my entire business and did this. All right, now, you know, where, you know, your signature event was the first thing that brought people to the city is now kind of in the end of spring, beginning of summer, you know, now you've got a, a fucking stupid word, pivot, pivot to, you know, all right, let's put some new programs kind of in that spring. So May, let's do a spicy food fast. Let's do, you know, and caused us to do kind of a dynamic shift and experience with, uh, experiment with capital and saying, all right, well, you know, put our money where our maths are, we're good at this, you know, and then trying to get people to buy in and, you know, with our seafood festival and you know, like, what did we pull off in 2021? We pulled off the beer fest, we pulled off micro wrestling, we pulled off the dragon boat we raised, we pulled off, um, seafood, uh, did I say seafood fest? Yeah. So that's how good it was. I said it twice. <laughs> uh, we pulled off witchcraft, we pulled off the tattoo expo. So it was like, all right, you know, we're back in business. Um, and then it was like looking at this year, 2022, kind of like, all right, well, what do we add to the calendar, you know, and what do people want to participate in and, you know, who has staff to participate in shit. And so that's kind of, you know, there's just more and more challenges, you know, coming out of 21, thinking 22 is going to be, you know, everybody's going to want to partner. Everybody's a visionary. Everybody's excited and learning the exact fucking opposite. You know, everybody's kind of still hiding. Yeah. And now you're doing another outdoor festival. And John, I'm sorry, um, you don't have any more hair to lose uh, worrying about the weather. So here's what witchcraft um, taught me, barring a fucking hurricane. Yeah. How about that? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, witchcraft, which was our mystical encounters and brews and spirits, 
um, in 19 was a fantastic experience. Uh, then the place that we did, we're doing witchcraft, we're under construction, no events were happening, and then we canceled it in 2020, and then found a new location in 2021, which I just actually announced the dates for uh, this year. Um, I was always kind of rain or shine, rain or shine, rain or shine. We've done a seafood fest in the monsoon, it sucked, it was terrible, it was stressful. Um, our biggest payday is the, clearly the beer music festival that allows us the luxury of kind of experimenting with other events and programs. Um, and I was always weird with the rain or shine, rain or shine, rain or shine. This year for witchcraft, I was like, well, we got no other options. You know, everybody's fighting for dates in the calendar from an event perspective, from a, you know, from a calendar perspective. There's only so many days. Um, everybody from the, you know, from the brewery partners, the distillery partners, vendor partners, talent partners, all have things booked on bookend weekends. So that whole uh, raid date thing, that's out the window. Like any, there's economically for any large scale festival, rain dates just aren't a thing. They don't exist, you know, throw them out, throw them out, throw that baby out with the bathwater, right? So we leaned into the rain or shine thing. Um, two hours into witchcraft, which was fucking rad, uh, skies opened up and I thought, all right, it's going to be a mass exodus. We had sold 3,000 tickets. People are going to fucking run and I'm standing near the gate and it just, <laughs> and nobody was moving. Everybody was drinking, dancing, just having a blast in the rain. I turned to uh, my team and I was like, yep, we're rain or shine for everything, you know, and that's kind of how we're going to take it. You know, like when we talk about the beer fest in June, yeah, it could fucking rain, you know, but beer's wet, you know, make the best of it. And I think that as a human race, right, we're too consumed with the things that make us uncomfortable and, you know, and discounting experiences because it's fog it's muggy out it's raining out it's too hot it's like when i announced that we were doing the event outside again in june i had fucking people crying about well what about if it rains or it was too hot or if it was like <laughs> what the fuck have we done to the to human beings in this country over the last couple of years where you know everybody thinks their, their opinion counts and everybody's afraid of everything the internet you know, john the internet yeah right it is and here we are we're on the internet you know, whatever happened to go with the flow, man, go with the yeah. flow. You know, some of the best experiences are, you know, unplanned, you know, weird circumstance, you know, and if it rains and you get wet, what's the worst thing that happens? You get wet. Yeah. You think about the people at Woodstock. I remember, I remember seeing pictures of people just completely muddy. Yeah. Yeah. And that's funny because, you know, that's kind of going to be a message um, that we put out there like we've we've already kind of thought about the weather kind of scenario for kind of all the events across across the board and working with um, the cancer support community um at gilda's club to create sunscreen stations right um and to have um rain slickers available if it rains right and you know in the back it's like fuck it it's a festival it's a party and sometimes it rains yeah yeah and i'm sure that you learned a lot you know, the first year at Bader Field, you and you took everything. You're you're not a you're you're a planner. You, you said that. So you, obviously, you took all you took a lot of notes. You 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 know what you you did bad. You know what you could do better. Uh, and I'm sure it's going to come back this year. Um, better than last year, for you know, sure. Every time you do something, like from raising kids to cooking meals to you've got to do it once to improve it. Yeah. Right. And we we did 15 years of a festival indoors. Um, and we've no stranger to outdoor events, but this, this being, you know, a massive undertaking, um, had some tweaks. So we laid it out, we let it happen and we watched kind of where the chips fell. Uh, and yeah, the learnings, I mean, and the learnings are obvious, you know, the learnings that you see change the festival as it, from, as it stays as an outdoor festival, the learnings were eliminate night sessions. There is unnecessary risk, uh, when you can't light 146 um, acre space properly, you know, yeah. so there's massive learnings there. Right. Um, and that caused us to say, okay, let's day drink. Let's have an outdoor festival in the daytime. And when we announced that it was went from three sessions to two and, you know, people lost their minds. It was, it was Lord of the flies fucking weird, bro. Like I'm watching kind of, and you know, they say, don't read the comments. I read the comments and I comment, I tend to comment via GIF. Yeah. Right. Like, all right. Like, you know, if you say something stupid, you're getting a stupid gift and just watched people as if they'd never attended anything outside 
September. Yeah. And when the vast majority of music festivals are all daytime and outdoors. So just watching this weird, like, what the fuck are you people crying about? Like, we figured out a way to keep you safer, to yep. make the environment the safer environment, you know, and giving you opportunities to explore Atlantic City from, you know, pre and post festival to where before, you know, the festival was over at, you know, midnight or 10 o'clock. And it was like, all right, well, here's the select opportunities because of time frame. Now those opportunities have been greatly expanded because you've got more time to explore Atlantic City. And we yeah. encourage that. And you're going to see um, shortly, you're going to see programs where we talk about why, you know, how to how to explore Atlantic City. And we're going to give you tools and keys to do that. Uh, and it, because we're obli- we have an obligation to the city to drive tourism and we've got obligations to friends who owns bars and restaurants and whatnot to, you know, to just traditionally when the festival is at the center of the city, I fucking ramble. Don't I ramble? I'm a ramble. No, you're good. This is a lot of good information. The, the festival is, you know, and any festival is dead center to the city. You know, we used to dump everybody out, all 30,000 people over the course of the weekend into the city. You know, now we're at Bader Field. We're on the, you know, on the shoulder of the city. So we have to come up with tips and tricks to get people kind of to roll in, you know, to the city to kind of experience some of the rad food and culinary and people and entertainment that the city has to offer. Yeah. And and everyone thinks that these festivals just happen and they, they know more than the guys actually doing it, guys and girls doing it. Um, I mean, I was there last year. Um, the only, and I'm sure you've probably came up with a solution or at least to, to minimize it. Uh, I mean, I don't have a complaint because I love you and I know how much hard work you put into it, you and your staff. So there, this is not a complaint. I think from what I heard, you know, being there was, you know, um, Ubers and things like that getting to, and then ultimately from, you know, when it was over getting, getting out of the, the area. Yeah, so that falls back under that. You got to do it once to see what's broken, sure, right? Of course. Um, and then it ended up being a sub- supply and demand issue as well. There's only so many Uber drivers. There's only, mm-hmm. you know, and attendees forget that they need to take a level of responsibility for themselves. Yeah. Right. Um, the Uber, Lyft, uh, rideshare thing was one of the first things that we tackled coming into this year uh, to where we're so much so where we've got a partnership with Lyft now. I'm sorry, Uber now. Um, and kind of put an APB out to all the Uber drivers from here to Philly that speaks to the demand and where to drop off and where to pick up, you know, and being able to communicate that to the riders as well as, you know, to the drivers themselves, you know, because they're independent contractors, but it does fall into a a supply and demand issue, Mm -hmm. right? There's only so many of them. And, you know, this year there'll be two sessions of 10,000 people, you know, plan accordingly, take responsibility for your own kind of experience, you know, and I don't know when and how people thought they, they needed to be spoon fed, right? Like, Hey, you know, okay, let me hold your hand and get you to the call, you know? Um, but understanding that, yeah, that was for people that was a bit of a bugaboo. So making sure that there's more jitneys, you know, apparently people don't like to walk, right. And people hate <laughs> that. And that, that was kind of one of the complaints was, well, how do we get You know, we're going to Caesars. Well, you know, Caesars is actually 1.5 miles away. You could walk. Mm -hmm. Ugh, whoa, walk. (laughs) You know, but I'm going to be banged up. Okay, well, let get yourself to the boardwalk. Get yourself to the boardwalk, which is a quarter of a mile from Bader Field. You've spent the whole festival walking a mile. You did it. You were doing it. You were doing it so you can walk another quarter of a mile. We're going to arrange to have all the rolling chairs from the city meet festival attendees at the (laughs) end. at the beginning of the boardwalk by Stockton. So walk that far and then throw somebody who's working for a living 20 bucks to push you down and have this rad Atlantic city rolling chair experience. Yeah. Like, okay. So now we've, we've, we've held, we've held your hand with the Uber situation. We've gotten this rolling chair piece. We're working with the Jitney association, you know? So now it's like, all right, here are kind of key ways to come in and come out and arrive early. If you don't want to wait in line, show up early. You know, if you show up at, you know, two o'clock on the nose Saturday, 12 o'clock on the nose Sunday, you're going to wait. And that's kind of your own fault because we've asked you to arrive early. Yeah, we were at the Hard Rock and um, we we requested a couple Ubers that, I don't know if they canceled us or what happened, but the best was um, the limo drivers took advantage of the whole situation because mm-hmm. they were charging 20 bucks a person yep. 
and they were putting eight, nine, ten people in. But you made new friends in the, the limo on the way there. You're all going to the same place. You're all the same goal. And, you know, you got there quick. It was it was it was good. It's listen, it's this is a tourism market. It's based on every everything from the hot dog vendor to the street to the limo driver you met to the, you know, to the guy part valley parking your car to everything costs money. Everything's a dollar. Everything and people forget that. People yeah. forget that this is a tourism and it's significantly less expensive than other tourism driven markets. But every time somebody has got to pull a dollar out, twenty dollars out, it's like, ah, oh, it's the end of the world. <laughs> Convenience costs money. Yeah. That's why you're paying two dollars for a twenty ounce bottle of soda at a uh, convenient mart, and when a, a two liter bottle at the grocery store is a dollar. Yeah, true story. True story. But, like you know, we, I do. I think we do a good job of being cognizant of cost, right? Um, I struggle with raising ticket prices. You know, I believe my festival is under is my price point is far less than what the offering is. Sure, you know? it's not just beer fest; it's everything we do. You know, I think the offering is significantly less than, you know, or, or more than what the experience costs. You know, think about this year, Alkaline Trio, right? You know, um, when are you posting this? Uh, next week, sometime. So, okay, Alkaline Trio. So today's today is the February second, so around the ninth. All right. Well, tomorrow I'm going to announce that Thrice is opening for Alkaline Trio. Okay. You know, fantastic. Um, newfound glory. Um, I, I got announced after Valentine's Day. I can announce the support acts, which are big. You know, so you're going to go to a concert. Essentially, all the beer you can drink. Right. Tons of activities for seventy dollars plus tax and fees. Like, if you go to a, just a just a concert ticket, will cost you forty or fifty bucks. Then go get two beers. You've already spent more than you spent on your Atlantic City Beer Music Festival ticket. Buddy, I don't know who you're seeing for. 40, 50 bucks. I mean, you, you, you see a, a band like the Foo Fighters or someone of that level. I mean, even if you want to see the Newfound Glory, you're going to spend. The all right, maybe maybe that's around the, the price point you're talking 50 about. 50, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. But yeah. Our so trio, same exact thing. Uh, you get two beers at one of those shows. That's, that's 20 bucks right there. Top. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, people, people need to realize kind of what's involved in the experience, uh, how much is going on. And it's not just beer fest. It's witchcraft. It's, you know, uh, it's the the seafood fest it's kind of all of these programs they have a cost but the cost is far less than the the actual value itself of the experience and i think smart consumers realize that um smart event producers you know kind of look at their price points and look at you know is this worth is the juice worth the squeeze you know and i think i lose sleep over it i lose sleep over pricing and making sure our pricing is accordant. and i'll do it I, i'll say okay i'm gonna go to a concert i'm gonna do this I'm grabbing some beers. I'm going to get something to eat. All right, cool. I'm literally three times what I, what I'm asking people to spend on our experience. Right. So AC beer fest, June 4th, 4th and 5th. I'm going to be watching, listening, check out the uh, events from previous years, check out photos, but definitely uh, get tickets for this year. It's always a good time. Um, you talk about getting people to talk about uh, your events and things like that. You added, I want to say it was 2016, uh, the micro wrestling mm -hmm. for us children. You know, I, 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 was it always called micro? Was it ever called midget wrestling? So when we start, so here's who changed how it was. It's funny. Um, it was midget wrestling. Midget wrestling, Luster, yes. midget wrestling. All yes. of our wrestlers, Fly and Ryan, Little Mario, Little Miss. Little I'm Mario, a he's a man. Yeah, Little Mario's a man. I'm a midget wrestler. I'm a midget wrestler. Fast forward two years into it, um, I you know put the event up and go to launch the event, and it says no. Got flagged. A derogatory term. Yeah. So yeah. I call I call my buddy Jack Darrell, who owns the Micro Wrestling Federation. I'm like, dude. He's like, I'm in the process of literally. We discovered it at the same exact time. He had to uplift and change his entire fucking business model to be micro. You know, we had, in, which is, we just had to change some names. This guy had to do, change his entire program, website. Like he had to scrub his entire site to make sure that the word midget wasn't anywhere. You know, we had to do the same thing, but not to the extent that this guy who's been running this troop for almost a decade had had to do. So it was crazy. Uh, but it was Facebook that 
mm-hmm. ultimately determine the name change from midget to micro. You know, and it was funny. I'd gotten the first year we did it. I had a woman call, actually called, and she was abrasive. <laughs> uh, she's like, I can't believe you can sleep at night. What if that was one of your kids? I was like, lady, if that was my kid, I'd be the guy in the front row with the foam finger waving it because he found an advantage. Uh, t- he found something that may have been a disadvantage and turned it into an advantage. And he's yeah. getting paid. I pay these people. I know what they fucking make. And they're doing better than most. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. I'm sure. Yeah, I was, I was sure you got uh, some nasty messages for that. Well, it was funny. I was, I was hoping because I had some friends on the hook and we made signs. Um, with arrows and stuff. I was hoping we'd get protesters because I had friends uh, dressed as wizards and I was going to have them go stand by the by the uh, people protesting with signs, with arrows pointing to the people that said, these people hate magical creatures. <laughs> it never happened, but it was we were ready for it. I was excited. I was hoping it was going to be a thing because that would have been part of our promo video, you know, the protesters, because everybody loves to get protested. Absolutely. As we learned through 2020. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, yeah. Uh, you know, you talk about censorship, you talk about, uh, you know, Facebook kind of putting the, the screws to you a bit. I mean, how, how do you, as, as someone who likes to push the envelope, likes to make people talk, how do you navigate the world that we're living in? Because everything's so, everyone's so sensitive. Everyone, you, you know, you, you constantly have to worry about, you know, someone who doesn't want to get wet at a festival and, and, and all these things. Like how... How do you, as, as someone who likes to I said, push the envelope, how do you how do you navigate all that? I'm a firm believer that cooler heads are eventually going to prevail, right? Um, I never do anything intentionally to make anybody feel excluded, or of course. I, I, and I think we emanate that, right? From a from a um, from a company standpoint, from a you know, um, listen, you're happy. It's not my job. It's not my place to make you feel unhappy. It's not my, and it's never my intention, right? So if it's life choices that you make, or if they don't in line, align with what we do, then don't be a part of it. But I'll never actively make you feel uncomfortable about the choices that you make. Um, and as a festival philosophy, we do the same thing. Um, it was funny. One thing, I don't even know if this is a good idea that I even bring this up. Uh, <laughs> so I have like five listeners. It's fine. That's all right. See, see, all right, cool. Um, Maybe more than that, oh, but you're good. You've got significantly more than five lists. <laughs> um, so I had struggled with um, pre-2020, right? I wanted to book against me in the worst way. I thought, this is a real fucking rock and roll band. Yeah. Right? Against me, Laura Jane Grace, just a fucking rock and roll band. Um, my fear was that the craft beer community wouldn't embrace the transgender portion of, right. um, of against me, you know, and in doing that they they would miss just some of the best fucking rock and roll music that exists on our planet right now. Yep. Um, I think against me is a better than the Foo Fighters. I think the, I think it's just a fucking fantastic band. Um, and I thought, you know, in, in 18, you know, Jason, who does a lot of the booking for us, we talked about it. I was like, nah, maybe not yet. Cause there's still a little bit of that, you know, macho man in, in the beer world. I mean, it's the beer world. Uh, and then in 19, um, I watched a brewer kind of poke her head out. Um, and, she, you know, she was a friend and she, you know, going through the transition. Uh, and I thought, all right, if this, this is my, this is my, um, I guess, canary in the coal mine, I guess, I think is a proper analogy. Sure. Uh, if she's thriving in this industry, make it make it um, against me an offer because now I see a level of acceptance. I see that this is cool and this is cool because, you know, beer fest has always had, you know, men, women, gay, straight, black, white, you know, people, humans of all shapes and sizes kind of always came together um, in all of our events to celebrate, you know, seafood, beer, horror, you know, whatever. But this was that kind of that lit that, all right, now I know that, you know, we are completely, open-minded to to what's going on in the world and never would do anything to make anybody feel uncomfortable like bringing a against me and a Laura Jane Grace to kind of our, our main stage and unfortunately because of COVID it fell through and then the brand kind of band went their separate ways but um that was kind of for us my thought 
my feeling has always been like the weather thing. If you're afraid of getting wet and you're afraid of getting, you know, a sunburn, I've got very little empathy. I got no empathy for that, you know, but we would never put or do anything that would, from a festival standpoint for any of our programs, exclude or um, make anybody feel like they didn't belong. Uh, because it's counterproductive to what we do as event producers. You know, if I do my job correctly, everybody belongs. You know, if the subject matter, whether you're straight, gay, trans, big, fat, black, white, whatever, um, you know, if that, you know, if our subject matter fits you, then you are welcome. Um, you know, I never subscribe to that. You know, when people say, oh, I don't see, I don't see black or white. Bullshit, you're fucking lying. I see big noses. I see big tits. How do I not see black and white, right? Um, it's just, I don't give a fuck, you know? And kind of our organization is just like, man, if you're going to have a good time and you can embrace the good time and add to the good time and, you know, be a part of that experience, we don't give a shit and we'll never make you feel uncomfortable. Uh, so that was kind of the way we always went into it, especially with this. It was unapologetically welcoming. You know, and I think that's probably the best way to say it. Um, you know, the whole cancel culture thing, I don't subscribe to. And I think if you don't subscribe to it, it doesn't affect you. Um, as long as you're honest, and you're mm -hmm. honest, and, you know, treat people the way you want to be treated regardless. So I think we've, I think we've kind of navigated that, this thing that we're going through right now, I think relatively honestly. Um, you know, I don't think we've ever been called on a carpet for any of it, uh, because I think, you know, it's all going to, I to a fault, put myself out there. Um, so I think if that were to be a thing, we would have experienced at this point, you know, but, you know, I, I you know, I think the, the short, the short version of that fucking 30 minute answer I just gave you um, is, you know, I think at some point, you know, we're all going to be, have to be a little honest with ourselves and cooler heads will prevail. Now you're, uh, you're like me, you're a fan of Joe Rogan. What are you, what are your thoughts on him? Right now, uh, now that we're, we're talking about, so here's here's what I'm disappointed in. Um, shut the fuck up about the COVID, man. It's all he fucking talks about. I know. You know, um, it's all he fucking talks about. You know, and I I enjoy some joke. I think there's a level of honesties with some of the guests that people don't like to admit, right? I think you know, I think and I always get a kick out of people who are on their Facebook pages and saying, "Ah, oh, Joe Rogan's stupid." The fucking man is far from fucking stupid. Yeah. Right. Um, you just don't agree with what he has to say. And I think that's a defense me mechanism for a lot of us. If we don't understand or we don't agree, you're stupid. You know, yeah. I, you know, I, I listen, I used to, I don't listen as much because he just constantly fucking banging that COVID bang, yeah. bang, bang. And I'm just like, dude, I want to hear fucking rad guests who have nothing. Get Cam Haynes back on here. Yeah. You know, I thought, you know, the fucking jewel interview was probably one of his best interviews in a long time. <laughs> Snoop Dogg. Uh, I mean, Snoop Dogg. you know what? Him and Joe, you know what? I bought the Snoop Dogg bothered me about the Snoop Dogg episode. They might as well have jerked each other off. <laughs> you know, like, it was just yeah. like, oh, John got Snoop. Oh, I got Joe. And it was like somebody <laughs> the lotion. Yeah. Again. It's like, yeah, I didn't, I didn't listen to the full thing. Um, yeah. You know, but, and when the, all the doctors came on, I was like, now nah, I'm not going to subscribe to this. I want the funny. Like, and I was listening to the one on Carrot Top. I've always been intrigued by Carrot Top because he's kind of a mutant. And <laughs> halfway through, they get right into the COVID talk. I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? This is supposed to be our escape. And I can yeah. see why, you know, I don't, I genuinely don't think he's spreading misinformation. I don't. I think he's giving alternative viewpoints and he's get, bringing up resources that are valid resources, but he's beating this fucking horse to death. Yeah. I mean, he took that CNN thing to uh, you know very personal which uh, rightfully so rightfully so yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah it's it i mean he lost me for a bit i mean i'm a, i'm one of the biggest Rogan fans i have a uh a, 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 yeah. yeah, a lamp made by my buddy scott nichols out of like metal and shit um a joe rogan lamp uh yeah and he just lost me and i just I, again i mean we i interview a lot of bands i interview people whose lives have been I mean, all of our lives have been affected by COVID, but like your livelihood, the way you put food on the table for your family, the way you put, you know, uh, your kids through college and all that kind of shit was affected by COVID. So I feel like every conversation I have is that it's like, you bring it up for a second because you have to, because like, you want to know how they, you know, have navigated the past year and a half, two years. Uh, and I, I'm genuinely concerned about people because 
I was worried about you. I know we, we texted a few times and you were just, you know, kind of, you, you, you know, you told me like, you know, I, you just felt, you know, the way you just expressed earlier. But, um, I talked to a lot of musicians and like, obviously getting on stage and, and performing and, and all that kind of stuff is part of who they are and what they do. Um, so it, it, but yeah, so it, it's constantly COVID, 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 COVID. And I, yeah, I, I, I had Joe Rogan as my escape. You know, he and, escape anymore because it's all he talked about. Yeah, and, you know, and it was funny. It was like the whole vaccine thing. You know, I I was a big advocate of personal choice, and I still to this day I'm a big advocate of personal choice. I got yep. vaccinated right down to because of the lead by example thing. Yep. Right. My family said, you know, we're asking people to gather. We're asking people to come back and get you know get together, you know, support each other, support businesses, support our business, support our friends' businesses, support live music, support, you know, and what was our clearest path? We've got to use all the tools in our toolboxes. You know, I didn't subscribe to the um, you know, microchip bullshit. I didn't subscribe to, and I used common sense. It is not in our country's best interest to kill its population. Right. I think it was a Bill Burr who said, you know, they don't want to, like, so if we were all sheep and you know yep. coming to to you know getting vaccinated and following the rules, would they want to kill all the people that listened and followed the rules? Probably not, right? No. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's like you know, so you know, we we it wasn't even a it wasn't even a hard decision to make, you know. And I let my kids, everybody, make your own decisions. I be and I and I would never ever, um, you know, and I got a lot of friends that are shitting all over people who don't want to get vaccinated. And it's just like, listen, man, it's not your fucking business. It's so crazy. And, you know, Joe talks about it all the time, too, like just this tribal mentality. And like, if you're not with me, then fuck you. Like, when did we get to that point? When, when did that happen? You I know, it, the ability to it, these fucking things. It's these yeah, fucking things. it's politics and the Internet. And it's like, you know, hiding behind a computer screen. Like I could say the worst meanest shit to you right now because I know that you can't physically hurt me, but I would never say them to your face. A, I don't mean them, but B, because you'd punch me and knock me the fuck out. <laughs> you know, and it's it, like, there's a, I think personal responsibility and accountability with yeah. the internet went out the window. Out the window. You know? Gone. Like, I can hang out in California and you'll never get to me, you know, and I can say the dumbest shit that I don't even believe, but you know, because I'm getting a stir out of you, because I'm getting your blood boiling, because, uh, you know, and people get off on that. I, yeah. I think we've taken some of the, I think these, these things, these fucking things <laughs> have taken a lot of the humanity out of humans. Yeah. yeah absolutely right. And I always say like, we're, we're so connected, but so disconnected at the same time. It just, it sucks. I, I, access to information we've got access to information whether the information is right or wrong we've got more access in to information than humans have ever had ever it's weird too because i often say like i wish i was born in the era that my parents grew up in uh my parents were born in the 50s so they like you know had a great time in the 60s 70s and things like that so and then just recently and you're not much older than me but I, I was listening to a podcast of uh, some kids that were like, are like 26 years old said the same thing. I feel like we're born in the wrong era. And I'm like, is the world that we're living in right now so bad that we all just wish we could go back and live in the 60s and 70s and, and grow up there? Like, what are we doing? I think it was, it was it, there were errors of... And you got to, you know, look at the source, like guys like us that say, hey, you know, if we were, we would have thrived in the 50s and 60s, it was, it was an error of kind of taking care of you and your own. Um, chivalry was still a thing. You know, I fucking opened the door for a woman that last week, two weeks ago. At, I'm very, very big, you know, ladies order first. Blah, blah, you know, like I'm, I, it's kind of ingrained in my body. Yep. Um, and I try to, you know, I try to, you know, with my girls, I'm like, you know, see how I treat your mom, see how that's what you want to look for lead by example yeah and i opened the door for a girl and uh here you go i don't need you to hold the I, door. I was like i'm an independent woman yeah i was like no i mean no it's just it's easy just yeah i don't need you but i was like holy fuck and i just looked at this lady i was like miss 
was like, you're going to have a rough way to go. There's a duck loose in my office. I'm just trying to be nice. Like, yeah, you're going to like, I'm just trying to be a nice guy. I would have done it for the guy, too. Like, I mean, like, we're all people here, you know? Yeah. yeah, I just, I think the human connection is now bound by Wi-Fi and wires. And it's not as, it's not as real as it should be. Um, yeah. You know, and I think and I, that's why, you know, I mean, I love what I do because it's, it's bringing people together. You know, I'm not going to tell you to eat a bag of dicks to your face because we're hanging here. I'll eat a bag of dicks with you. Great. Let's just share a bag of dicks. Right. <laughs> um, you know, it's just, I think it's the personal, t- personal connection is gone. It's, you know, and, and respecting people's boundaries and life choices. And, you know, because it's good for you doesn't mean it's good for me. And, you know, and understanding that. And I think we lack understanding. I think we lack fucking empathy, like nobody's business, because again, we're fed so much information that we know better. We, I know more than you do because I saw it on CNN. I know better because but that's the problem too. We're being fed these lies from, uh, you know, what we've been told are credible media sources for all of the, all these years, and they're not. Mm-hmm. They're trying to get clicks and all the money. And I, I don't want to sound like a fucking nut job, but I mean, we are. That's 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 real. I mean, you no, know, it's it's when, anytime I see something that's you know an article that's followed by an advertisement or. Uh, a news that's followed by an advertisement, my brain auto- automatically goes to, well, you want to keep me involved and engaged. So you're going to tell me what I want to hear to keep me here. And, you know, regurgitating your same shit. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, we're, I think we're being fed poison. I think we're being fed narratives um, that aren't always in our best interest. I think, you know, I think it comes from the top down. I think, you know, uh, we're stuck with poor leadership. Uh, poor leadership gives gives these news organizations that are bookends opportunities to use us as product. And, you know, it's just, it's hard to decipher and share the truth when, I mean, do we even know what the truth is? Yeah. You know? I got, I, mean, I got an argument. This is probably f- almost probably 10 years ago, just saying like how, it, you know, it's not fair to us as human beings when, you know, you hear, let's just call it Fox News and you hear CNN and, and you see, you, these are sources that you have believed to be telling you the truth for all these years. And I'm like, why can't we get the truth? The person's like, well, you should just, uh, you know, listen to what they're telling you and, and, you know, uh, just kind of figure it out on your own. It's like, well, don't they have an obligation to, report news factual news the way things happen and never skew to you know in their own direction or you know this person's direction like that and it's not that's not fair to the human race and they have an obligation they have you know they get paid to do that i think nothing brought that to the surface like this did you know this whole you know last two years did terrible look at how many news organizations had death counters on their fucking like move during fucking even quality programming is like here's the death count here's the blah 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 and like they fed off it and fed off yeah. it fed off it and and people you know, are home that. scared like almost like like you know wrapped up in a blanket like oh my god the, the world everyone's dying we can't leave the house yep and you know how you feel is wrong and if you don't feel the way we feel you're wrong and yeah. you're the enemy and it, it, it's been a constant from all the news organizations right left it is constantly looking for villains. We're not propping up heroes. We're not propping up. We're looking and outing villains for the silliest shit on the planet for being human. And it just, it's gone. It's, it's just gone off the fucking rails. And it's week by week too. It's like, you know, they're raising the torches this week against Joe Rogan. Next week it's going to be whoever, na- you know, name it. Like it's just, it's, it's crazy. Yes. Yes. As long as it's not you or I. Okay. Yeah. And I, I don't mean, think- and I don't. I honestly don't think it would be you or I because I think, I think we're honest in kind of how we handle ourselves. Yeah, I mean, you know, we're people. We and we, we you know, we don't. It, it just, it's common sense. Like, just don't be an asshole. Like, that's like, don't be an asshole. Don't lie. Don't cheat. Don't do those things. And things will be okay. Yeah. But so people we, get paid money to lie. We people should rally. Cheat against you know there's the war on drugs there's the war on you know terrorism we should start the war on assholes yeah well the war on drugs is a fucking scam yeah 100 percent. 100 it's a fucking lie too like, yeah yep. oh man yeah 
Well, before we get too far in, I mean, we could go down this rabbit hole. We'll yeah, and, four o'clock in the morning. Yeah, and, and no one wants to listen to me no talk anymore. But, more of this shit, fucking these fucking guys. But real quick, before you leave, you you started a podcast, which I and I know why. I, well, I have a feeling of why you know it, it it ceases to exist because you kind of started it when you know Jason, one of your your booking partners with Near Dark Entertainment, um. He was not busy because no one was booking entertainment. You obviously were, uh, you know, going through, you know, no events. Uh, Kobe uh, with the, the cars. I, I don't know. He, I think he was just along for the ride because he was still doing all right. But he started a podcast called uh, Big Boy, Big Boy Voices. We're not. Which, we're coming back. We're so we've already started that. Okay, great. We took a sabbatical. Kobe had a thing going on. Um, Jason and I got busy again. Um, and we, it was like getting these businesses back up and running was a 48, yeah. you know, 48 hour a day kind of thing. Well, let's paying the bills. <laughs> yeah, paying the bills. Um, the podcasts were fun. We really enjoyed were, it. It was a good camaraderie. So good. Um, so yeah, we've got a couple things. I've got some guests lined up, um, come mid February, we're going to jump back into it. Um, and Danica Lane, she calls, she's like, I want to be back on the podcast. <laughs> um, it was great know, so content. Good. You know, we, we my fear and why, and this is a real thing. One reason that we stopped doing it is because I didn't want to continue to talk about COVID. I didn't want to continue to talk. I didn't, and I knew it was going to go that way. Mm -hmm. um, and there were days where I was probably angrier than um, I should have been. Uh, and I think that would have translated to, you know, this isn't enjoyable if he's fucking ranting. Because if, if you notice, there were a couple episodes as we kind of got, I started to go there and I saw yeah. that. I didn't want it to be that. I wanted it to be, kind of fun and jovial. I mean, we had some great guests and I've got some great guests lined up um, and we want to do some on location stuff. And, you know, um, you know, so we're talking about it. We're talking about mid February, kind of bringing it back to life um, or season two, as we'll call it. Sure. Uh, Cause I think we got like 14 or 15 really good episodes. Um, you know, not to, you know, we're not at the 700, you know, Popco fucking episodes, but I'm only at 69. This is, this will be 70. Say, I would I'm like a nobody. I'm a nobody. The view's great. Um, but yeah, I think we're, we, I mean, we're definitely get back into it, you know, because there are things to say. I do love to hear myself talk clearly. You've, you said that. Yeah. But I almost, I almost texted you the other uh, day and said, Hey, uh, I want to sell your equipment. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually what I'm pipe, kind of piping through here because I put it on my computer. But yeah, yeah we want to get the guys back in the office, um, in the space and uh, kind of start talking about things. And it's cool because the dynamic is very, very different. You know, Jason and I are close. Kobe and I are close. Um, Jason's from one side of the planet. Kobe's on the other <laughs> side. You know, and, and Kobe says some offensive shit. Yeah. It's funny. But, you know, you know, sometimes, you know, you got to, you know, bring it up. Jason's very, you know, I tend to be kind of the way the pendulum sling, swings. I tend to be the middleman. Yeah. Because you know, I can see it because, you know, Kobe's older than I am. Jason's younger than I am. And I'm kind of right there in the middle. So it's a it's it's a fun dynamic that yeah now we're definitely it's coming back. I uh, was just kind of getting everything up and running. All of our lives kind of went in a different direction for a minute. Yep. Um, Kobe had some things going on. You know, Jason was you know getting back to work. I was getting back to work. So it took a bit of a pause. But yeah, now we've been talking about it for the last two or three weeks. Cool. Kind of lining up guests, content. We're gonna do a we're back bitches episode, and uh, yeah, season two I guess we call it. Call it that. That works. No. Yeah, buddy. Well, hey, I'm looking forward to Big Boy Voices coming back, available on all the streaming services. I'm excited for 2022 events from Good Time Tricycle. So you'll be there. Fest and, okay. You and that beautiful wife and that tiny little Lincoln of yours. You all I know. Gotta, I got I to gotta get rid of him for the, the, June, the June 4th and 5th date, dates. Yeah. Bring him down for Seafood Fest. Bring him down for midget wrestling. If I'm a, if I'm a wrestler short, I'll throw his little ass in the ring. <laughs> Good. He's tall, man. He's tall. But uh, thank you for doing this. I really appreciate your Amanda. time. What's that? He gets that from Amanda. Oh, dude, I know. I you know I always say that um, you know he he looks like her. He's tall. He's taller than the average kid. Gets that all from her. I, I, I said, you know what? What's going to happen is if we have a second child, it'll be a girl, and she'll look like me, and that's not good. That's not good. <laughs> or maybe it's, maybe maybe that's good for me. Maybe okay. that's good for me down the road. Uh, I'll explain to her like, listen, I'm sorry you're hideous. This is more for me than it is for you. Yeah, 
I don't want to have to kill somebody. I got, I got three pretty girls and all I worry about is all the fucking penises. And yeah. you know what? I'm a guy who likes fucking guns and isn't afraid of violence. So yeah. I mean, that's, that's why I always say it's, it's, it's a joke. And you, know, you say, I rather worry about one dick than, than oh, several, you know? Yep. yep. So we'll, we'll see what happens there, but dude, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, you know, we, we've been Talk friends for, for so long now and we've never had a chance to sit down and talk at length like this. I, and I, I, and I've always like, I follow you on social media. I, 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 you, you are not ever trying to hide who you are and what you do. And that's why I know a lot about you, but um, this is great to do. And uh, hopefully the next time we hang out, it's, it's more than a, a hello and a goodbye and we can hang out and uh, just talk about normal, normal human shit. We want to talk about, you know, what I do or what you do. We'll just talk about life and, and how good we really do have it because all things considered, we're doing all right. We're doing all right. Life doesn't suck. Life doesn't suck. I mean, a few curveballs in the past couple of years, but hey, if you're at bat and you can't swing at a curveball and you can't hit a curveball, you just try it at your next at bat. Right? Got to learn. You got to learn how to hit that curveball. True. So, give uh, us your websites and uh, real quick, just so if one, if someone wants to get tickets to your your events. Boom, so many of them. Uh, this will be longer than the fucking two hours we've been doing. Your drawing. website's good. Um, isn't there one, yeah, one, one good time, website? GoodTimeTricycle.com, ACBeerFest.com, WitchcraftNJ.com, KnehighKnuckleBusters, AC.com, WCFoodFest.com, John's Got a Beautiful Penis.com, um, all the dot coms. All the dot coms. Dot coms. Just type in John Henderson. You'll, find, you'll figure it out. You, you can Google me, and I'm actually um, – 500 different people of all makes and models, races and sizes. Click on any one of them and send an email and say, hey. Well, good time tricycle. And why is that? Because no one has had a bad time on a tricycle. You read that someplace. I did. <laughs> I, I, I may I, have known you for a long time. You know, I'm going to say that once because I always I, I love it because it's accurate. And yeah, I'm going to say it to that one person and be like, that's bullshit. I got fucking 10 pins in my knee because my uncle <laughs> Chip knocked over me in his Winnebago when I was driving my tricycle down the driveway. And I'm slowly going to just walk away from that guy. So, On a tricycle. <laughs> <laughs> I think the odds of that not happening are, are yeah, pretty I'll good. So I think just keep, just keep keep telling the story, buddy. Yes, sir. Dude, thanks again so much. I really appreciate it. Uh, and uh, hopefully I'll see you sooner than later. All right, player. All right, man. Family, my love. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm going to hit stop. Just stay, stick around though. All right. All right. We'll see you.